we'll do a quick to. quick intro. Um, so I'm Ann Mirko. Um, started Floodgate with Mike 10 years ago. Um, before that, uh, I was getting my PhD at Stanford in cybersecurity and math modeling. Um, when Mike convinced me to do this instead, um, I had worked prior to that for about five years. Um, yeah, I used to I used to be a startup founder, so I was involved with two startups in Austin, and then they were both went public, and I decided that I was too tired to do another one for a while, and so I thought I would invest, and the way to be an investor is to come up here, so uh, moved moved here in 2005 and just kind of immigrated uh, up here. It's been chasing things ever since. Um, so thanks so much for joining us tonight. Uh, we thought we would share with you a really short version of a class that Mike and I have been teaching at Stanford in the School of Engineering um, in the spring quarter. And this is an evolution of some of the thinking that we've had, we've had um, about what makes great startups work. And um, so the title of what, we're, what we wanna teach is Building for Intelligent Growth. We're gonna to aim to do it in a short period of time and then open it up for questions, but please feel free to ask questions in the interim. Um, that's basically the way we run our lectures at school as well. So a couple of motivating things for us um, before we dive into a couple of the frameworks that we wanted to introduce today. Uh, one observation we had just a couple years ago was that um, it's, it's, it's always been known that it's really hard to create a great company. Uh, and if you look at the numbers, um, it's exceedingly rare on some level, even though you see the number of unicorns is actually uh, growing over time. And it feels like when you read the news, um, it's always ever increasing. Um, and, but one of the really interesting facts is when you look at some of the, the companies in 2017, there are more in 2018 that failed, there were a bunch that had actually reached some pretty interesting peak valuations um, and had raised a really, a, a large amount of capital. And, um, and one of the things that it caused us to think about was this capital that was raised, even though it's from uh, greedy venture capitalists. Um, where we get our money from, for the most part, is not just rich institutions, but it can be hospital foundations, universities, uh, pension funds. Um, and so these are dollars that we're wasting um, that could have gone to the retirement of a, a teacher, a firefighter, um, it's museum dollars. Uh, so it's actually important and it's irresponsible for us not to ask the question, why did this happen and how can we do better? And so based on that, um, this is something that, that you know, Mike and I talked about was that we realized that there are, there are really interesting ways in which startups create value and that's the narrative we talk about in Silicon Valley is how do we create value? How do we create abundance? How do we create prosperity? Um, and we're able to do that through incredible technical innovations. But you can also, on the flip side, actually destroy value. And you could do that by consuming too much capital too quickly. Um, and so we thought about this, and we realized there are two common types of failures that we see in um, in startups, and one is what we would call unprofitable hypergrowth, and the second is we're going to call it product myopathy, and and so these are the two problems that we wanted to talk about today and how we think we can fix it. So the first one, Mike is going to talk about. Yeah. So um, one of the um, so. Um, we invest in these companies either too early or way too early. And uh, so, you know, usually we're kind of more co-conspirators than investors. And we've had some, some companies that we got involved with that got, you know, all the way to the promised land, right? Like Twitter, or, um, was it last, last April we went to, uh, got to go to New York to open the NASDAQ with Todd McKinnon and the Okta team. 
And there are other companies where they got off to just as good of a start as Okta, but for whatever reason, they just kind of went off the rails. You know, if you'd asked me, who are your super performing companies in the portfolio, there, I would have mentioned them, but then two years later, they, they, they were struggling to raise money at a price, they were struggling to ever be worth more than their preference stack. And you know, when, when, um, when you see that, right, you see these people, they, they're not just like a, a, a passive investment that you made, they're your peeps, right? They're sort of like people that you uh, have been in the foxhole with. And you know, it feels great to see the Todd McKinnons of the world crush it and ring the bell, but it feels really bad to, to see people who you think are maybe just as good uh, not only not get to the promised land, but not clear their preferred stack, and they end up staying uh, five years longer than they should, and their exit ends up being a function of the generosity of the carve out that the VCs give them at the end. And so, like, we thought that it was important to kind of ask, well, what, what can we learn from um, the things that worked and the things that didn't? And, you know, I've always been a big fan of Bill Walsh, a co coach of the 49ers. And whenever he would get surprised in a game, he would, he would vow never to be surprised again, never, never let that same circumstance ever occur and him not know what to do. Uh, and so we started to kind of really try to dig in and understand uh, what was happening. And so what we, what, what we came to believe was that, like, if you look at a, if you look at a start, if you look at any company, a typical company generates profits. Uh, not, not many of us do these days, but that's okay. Someday, hopefully, some of us might. And um, when a company generates a dollar profit, it has a choice. It can give the dollar back to the shareholder, uh, or it can invest the dollar back into the company. Now, if it invests the dollar back into the company, you would hope that it adds more value to the market cap of the company than one dollar, right? Because otherwise, you're destroying value when you reintroduce that dollar back into the company. And it's interesting, like when Warren Buffett invested in Coke, uh, one of the reasons he did was they changed their CEO. And before the Coke CEO, um, they'd bought a wine company, they diversified and done all this stuff. And the new CEO said, that's a bunch of crazy nonsense. That's just people wanting to build empires and be a conglomerate. We're just gonna sell Coke everywhere in the world because we know people want Coke and we know how to make it, and we know how to make money making it. So every extra profit dollar we generate, we're gonna, we're gonna invest in making everybody in the world want to drink Coke. And so uh, that's what they did. And now, you could debate the wisdom of whether that's a good thing for the world or not, but like it worked, right, from a capitalist point of view. So okay, why do startups lose money? Um, the reason is, theoretically, that there's a future big category out there and somebody's gonna be the category king of this future category. And whoever achieves that category dominance is gonna be super valuable, awesome company. And so what we decide when we're venture capitalists, we partner with founders and we say, the best way to create value right now is to lose money for the sake of owning a future category. Uh, but, but like, that, th there's a important there's an important qualifier there, right? It's not okay just to lose money just because, right? The idea is when money comes through the front of the business, in this case, venture capital dollars, not profit, what value creation comes out the back of the business? And one of the things that we noticed was that when we talked to founders and when we sat on boards, if you asked that question of the founders, they didn't have an answer. And if you asked that question of us, we didn't have an answer. If you have, it was like, do the best you can, I hope you make the numbers, let me know how we can help you. You know, oh, can we help you in recruiting? Can we give you some, uh, you know, advice on go to market? And so what, what, what we started to think about was all founders should look at the lens, look at their company, not just through the lens of creating a great product, but they need to be the chief value creation officer. They need to have an agenda that's clear about for the money we spend, what value comes out the other side? And we found that companies that understood that, that had a value creation agenda, on the balance did better than the ones that didn't. 
And, and the companies that didn't understand it, usually they just got lucky. They kind of stumbled into creating value. They just got onto the right winning recipe. So that was point number one. The other thing we found was that hacking, you know, I've been on, some of you may, this may resonate with some of you. Have you ever been in a company where somebody on the board says, well, we're not getting product market fit. We need a growth hacker. And, and I'm always like, no, we don't. We need a value proposition, right? Because like, if, if our value proposition is true, growth is syndicating the truth. Uh, and if our value proposition isn't true, we have to throw money at the problem of growth because we don't have real value. So we have this saying at Floodgate now, we call it hack value before hacking growth. And what we've learned is that hacking value is a completely different exercise than hacking growth. You know, when you're hacking value, you're going from zero to one. You're creating a product that nobody's ever seen before that delights customers and that nobody else can do it. We found that it takes a hugely variable, unpredictable amount of time. And so you gotta be super careful and hawkish about burn in this phase. But conversely, growth seeking is the opposite. It's about figuring out what's working and copying the thing that works with incredible discipline and integrity. Uh, so we're gonna talk a little bit about those different factors. So we like to say, Hacking value is like Earth. Hacking growth is like Mars, right? So uh, do you remember the movie The Martian where uh, Mark Watney, they say, I got to science the shit out of this. Like that's, that's what this world feels like. Whereas this world feels like, I'm not really sure who the product or customer is yet. So I better figure that out before I run out of money and it may take some time, but I've got to like, so like Twitch, it took five years for them to get product market fit. And people say to me, how did you know how to invest in Twitch? The answer is we didn't. We, we thought they were really good founders. And they say, well, how did you know live, you know, gaming, streaming would be a big thing? And the answer is we didn't. Justin TV games blew up inside Justin TV. Justin TV survived long enough for Justin TV to blow up because they didn't run out of money before they finished their value hacking. Um, whereas hacking growth, it's, it's interesting. We've learned through our analysis that a SaaS company with a million dollars ARR, should be able to go from one to 10 in 18 months or less with less than $9 million capital consumed if it is on a someday top quartile IPO track. And so, uh, but that's very different, right? That's very clear numbers, very clear agenda. There's a very clear sense of uh, physics of how that works. Uh, so these are, the, these are kind of the main points, and I hope I'm not repeating myself here too much, but. Um, you know, so like, we have not had good success, for example, in the value hacking phase if the founders say, we're having a hard time selling this, we need a salesperson. Because if somebody on the, on the founding team can't sell those early customers, we got a problem. Because no good salesperson wants to join a company with no sales yet. Uh, and so, you know, so, so we've kind of learned. a clear value proposition for customers. Yeah. It, it, and so like, you know, we need to find founding teams that have sort of the, 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 the mix of skills, hustle, execution, vision, all those things. But if we don't have those on the team we've discovered, it can be very difficult to ever get sort of the value hacking phase done. There's just not, not the right sort of blend and alchemy of capabilities on the team. Uh, and, then, and, and then the other thing is like, I like to say that, um, you're not persuading here, you're truth seeking here. Uh, I may date myself a little bit. How many, how many of you have ever seen uh, the Joe Colombo detective show? Okay, not many of you. So he's this guy, he's this old guy in a trench coat, and usually the bad guy is some rich dude who lives in a mansion. He goes in there and everybody discounts him and he walks around looking frumpy in his trench coat. And then he just asks a whole bunch of questions and he eventually sneaks up on the truth and gets the bad guys and all that. But like, to me, value hacking, like the metaphor I like to think of is Joe Colombo, right? It's, it's more about discovering the value than it is about persuading people about your value. It's more about truth seeking rather than persuading. Whereas here, it's more about, okay, so one, one yeah. Thing, though, in, my, um, in the hacking value phase, there's also two additional points I would make. One is that it, a lot of people think it's just about um, product hacking and figuring out product market fit. 
And when in reality, it's actually also the business model and the go-to-market have heavy influences on what the product will be as well. And so the best companies are doing um, go-to-market testing alongside product testing. And that, that's one point that I would say is important. The second thing, the reason why we think this low burn experimentation is so critical is um, I love the way uh, Ryan Smith from Qualtrics talks about it. He says it's a muscle memory. And if you've never done low burn experimentation, if you've never been frugal and had to survive on a small amount of capital, you'll never know how to do it. And so the value of remembering what that feels like is extraordinarily important, even when you get a lot of capital, because you'll know how important that capital is and you'll spend it in the right way. And we've, we've, we've been involved with companies before where the competitors raised massively more money than they did, but they tried to go straight to this mode and they didn't have the muscle memory or scar tissue of truly internalizing product market fit, so they just threw the money away. Because like if you don't, if, if there is not truth to your value, there's no amount of money that will compensate for that in the fullness of time. You have to, you have to discover the true value at some point to ever be great. Uh, now this is interesting over here, uh, and we may, we may drill down on this a little bit more later, but where the first place that people would go off the rails, we found, apart from, like if you don't hack value and go from zero to one, nothing matters, like you're, you just die, right? You just never get there. But the second problem that would happen is people would hack value successfully, and then they go raise a series A from somebody awesome. Everybody's high five at each other, we're awesome. And then they proceed to go right off the rails. They do their second product too early. They go in their second market too early. They go to Europe and Asia too fast. They just do too many things. And what they, this, this mode we have discovered, in contrast to this, which is highly unpredictable in time frames and execution, this is about copying the thing that works in a repeatable, scalable, reliable way. And so it, it requires a mental shift. And so we like to say going from here to here, it's like sailing through the Bermuda Triangle, right? It's like all the instruments you used to use don't work anymore. And you don't want to get stuck in the Bermuda Triangle. So the, the first failure mode we've seen is people don't finish this phase. They just never get there. The second failure mode, though, is they move through this Bermuda Triangle into this phase overconfident. And they don't realize that if they're not scared, they don't understand. If they, if they don't change their mode of operating, if they try to operate this way, they won't make it. They'll get, they'll get stuck. Um, so what, what, should we talk about uh, Zimride to Lyft? Yeah, so we thought one case study that we thought was a really good example of this was the case study of Zimride, uh, which eventually turns into Lyft. Um, so I met John and Logan um, in the summer of 2010. Um, convinced them to take a little over a million dollars from us. They were uh, basically a, a platform they were selling to universities. They had most of the UCs. Um, I think at the time they had 12 universities on the platform. People were exchanging rides, um, figuring out how to do carpooling um, in university settings. And Stanford was one of their first customers. Uh, they were selling it for you know, tens of thousands of dollars, up to $100,000. Um, and by the time we got to the Series A, they had been able to get into corporations like Intuit and Facebook were using it. Um, and it was the basis for getting Mayfield to come in and do a $6 million uh, investment into the company, I think at a $24 million valuation. And the thing that was interesting at that moment was that most people said, it's a very interesting company. It's like SaaS for carpooling and how big can that be? The interesting thing, at least internally from a board perspective, was that if you looked at the very first pitch that John and Logan did, it was all about how transportation actually shifts the economy and massive changes happen as a result of changes in transportation. They were discussing how actually the, the fabric of uh, the social, you know, the, the actual social appearance of 
um, societies and cities change with respect to how transportation changes, and so there's a fundamental impact on the economy. And they viewed actually that social identity um, in a networked graph actually started to create the next transportation change. And so the ability to actually know who the other person was that you were sharing a ride with was actually a real game changer. And we saw that actually within the Zimride platform, but they were looking for ways in which they could actually create more density. And they knew that if they went to corporations outside of universities, there would be a little bit more density. So you would add Hewlett Packard and you have a little bit more of Palo Alto. Um, and one of the things that they were trying to figure out was how do you get a lot of density up and down the peninsula? Lo and behold, at this point, they said, well, maybe that's not the answer. Maybe we do long distance trips. Like that's how we're gonna get more people using it. John and Logan start driving vans between LA and San Francisco. They're trying to add routes to Lake Tahoe. They're trying to add routes to airports just to see if they can get more and more people using it. Right? And then they realize that's actually not the way to get density, because density is the thing that they're seeking. They say, the iPhones come out, there's probably something in mobile. If we interlink it with social, we might have something. The initial idea was the reason why it's pink is they were going to go for an all-female network. Um, and then they realized that that really cuts off the market. And so the next time I talked to them, they said, we're going to just go for both genders or all genders. And, um, and so in August of 2012, they launched Lyft. But the story is interesting because first of all, they were very low burn until this moment. And a few months later, they raised from Founders Fund. Um, until this moment, they had actually several iterations of their fundamental product. And the one thing that they held true to was that they knew that they needed to get density of transactions. And that's what they continuously sought out. And so truth seeking, the point is, can last two and a half, three, four years. Who knows, right? The point is you actually have to have really low burn during that period because the lower the burn, the greater the odds that you actually survive to find the actual product that has product market fit. Within six weeks of actually launching Lyft, we knew we had product market fit. Well, and, and I think the other thing that we've learned is like, um, not all who wander are lost. Like that's, there's a saying that I like. And um, w where, where we have to help the founders and where the founders need to be strong is understanding that navigating this uncertain time is like core to value hacking and getting, uh, checking the box of zero to one. And where, where we could misbehave as investors would be to say, hey, why aren't you growing your revenues 15% a month or whatever? That's what it says in the you know, latest growth hacking blog. Uh, but what really matters is finding a, a winning recipe that you have supreme confidence can scale massively. And until we accomplish that magic moment, our work is not done in value hacking, we believe. And we actually are trying to learn a combination of good and bad surprises along the way because that means that our information about what the truth is increases. But what we're, you know, you're kind of, it's kind of like a top gun when you get radar lock. You're trying to get sort of radar lock on that uh, value proposition and the, th the, the things are spinning around the thing until they finally lock on. But it's like, you want to really believe that you got radar lock when you start to truly scale because if you do, if you don't have true product market fit, You'll, you'll throw money at the problem of growth and it just, it just goes away and you, you're not worth your preference stack pretty quick. Um, so, uh, so we talked, talked about the value hacking versus growth hacking. Um, any questions about that so far before we come to the value stack? Everybody's been very considerate and quiet and stuff. No, nobody's called BS on anything yet, which <laughs> kind of surprised me. <laughs> like one quick question for me is like, is um, if you're an entrepreneur, right, and if you believe, you know, everything you just said, uh, but if you sit in front of an investor, you, you sometimes you feel like you have to project conviction, right? Like you believe that, you know, um, Is this an SAS investor who is actually invested in you or? A 
potential investor. Okay. Potential. Yeah. You know, you're pitching like SaaS product for university for ride sharing, right? You have to believe that that is the is going to take you to the promised land, right? Like, how how do you mm. like do you be upfront with them? Say like, hey, you know. So. The, yeah, I, I actually so have an answer to that. Hacking, you know, how do you kind of balance that? This is an exercise I like to do with companies before I invest in them. Um, I go through a, a series of questions where we write down all of the things that we believe that even if the data comes out sort of gray area, we would probably continue to believe. And then we write out all the things that we could totally change. So as an example, there's a company that I'm investing in. I gave them a term sheet a couple weeks ago. It's in the education space. What we both discovered was we both believe in the education space credentialing is going to go away. We both believe that experiences and the ability to record what you know is going to be more important than where you went to school, what grades you got. We do not necessarily believe that his current product is necessarily the final product. Right? And, and I liked that experience of actually writing things down and then sort of sharing with each other just because it made me realize we were actually on the same page. And I actually had real doubts about the product because I didn't want us to go into this sort of this mode, right? And it actually allowed us to have an honest discussion about what amount should he raise so that he stayed in this mode. And so um, I think it depends on if your investors, if you can't have a frank discussion about what you believe and what you don't believe, then there are, there are other issues there, right? And, and so, so the best investors will want to actually keep you here so that you don't actually waste the dollars buying fake growth. Yeah, I guess the, the other thing I would add to that is that, and, and this, maybe you've seen this, uh, or maybe not quite yet, but what I, what I found when I was an entrepreneur was it doesn't matter if a lot of people like my idea or believe what I believe. What matters is that I have a secret that's true someday and that I can find that set of people who value my advantage. Those are the only people that matter. And so the best startups I've seen have this characteristic of the founder, the early investors, and the early customers all believe they're in on something together, right? That they, that they believe that the other people are full of shit and don't know what the truth is. We know what the truth is. We're going to prove it. And so, um, I, you know, when, as an entrepreneur in the early days, I would say, look, here's, here's what I do, here's what I believe is our secret. And if you don't agree with what I believe, I just gave you 45 minutes of your time back because nothing else I'm about to say to you is going to make any sense. And, and by the way, I need 45 minutes too. I need that extra time to find the person who does believe what I believe because I'll come back and see you later once I prove it. But it's like, like too many founders I've met try to outguess what the VC is looking for when they pitch them and how do I present it and how do I say it. And I think you're better off being awesome, syndicating the truth, and then having the faith that um, those who believe what you believe will, will want to follow you to battle. And that, that includes not just investors, but customers. Uh, I find that having discipline and integrity with those early customers who value your advantage is a big deal. And not spending time with the people who don't because you can't afford that time. You can't waste any herbs of energy on those people yet. So we're gonna shift focus a little bit to um, another problem that we've seen. And this is what we call product myopathy, which is in Silicon Valley, we know that we wanna build stuff that people want. But a company is not just that. A company is still an organization with people, with employees uh, who want a career path. It is a category that you're trying to build 
and it's a space in someone's brain who's going to buy your product. It is a set of proprietary secrets that you have. It is a whole set of things. And too often we find companies just focused on product and ignoring much of everything else. And so we think of this as sort of a full stack company. Who is capable of actually building a full stack company? And so we call this the value stack. And there's five different elements to it. Team, proprietary, product, business model, and category. And today we're really going to focus, I think, just on proprietary power, product power, and category power. I think the other two sort of speak for itself. Um, so what is proprietary power? For us, um, proprietary power, I always liked, and Andy Ratcliffe has this saying that you have to have a, an idea that is non-consensus but right. And I always liked this because um, it's very intuitive, right? So if, if your consensus, if your insight is highly consensus, probably lots of people know the incumbents know, all your competitors know, and so there's no point in a startup attacking a space that everyone believes to be true. What, what, the, what it reminds me of right now, and the reason we haven't invested in these companies is the scooter companies. So like now, the facts may prove us wrong not to have gotten engaged on scooters, but it just feels right now like it's just mindless competition. And every city one by one is gonna be able to award permits to whoever lobbies the local government the best. And you know, that's, you might be right as an entrepreneur that scooters are gonna be a thing, but if 20 other people have the same insight, money flies into the sector, and you know, there's just no room for error at all, and just overfunded startup after overfunded startup engages in a sloppy game against you, but you gotta play the game that's on the field. Uh, whereas up here, you're kind of like a, a baby wildebeest born on the Serengeti Plain. You know, you're sort of, you come, you, you wake up and you kind of are all wet and you've got about five minutes to start running. If nobody knows about you or nobody cares about what you're doing, you've got that time, you know. But if everybody knows about you and what, knows what you're doing, you know, the jackals and the hyena, hyenas and the Nubian vultures are circling. And so, like, when you're a startup, you want to have a little bit of time to be that baby wildebeest finding your footing. You kind of want to be in a situation, part of why it's good to have a secret is, you kind of want the world to not care that much about what you're doing because you're gonna screw up a few times with your early customers and you're gonna make mistakes and you want, you want to have a, an environment of forgiveness of those mistakes. Whereas an environment like this, there's no room for error, right? It's sort of like, let's be evil Knievel and whoever has the biggest tank jumps across the Snake Canyon and hopefully it's us, right? Uh, I, I always liked um, Peter Gastner, who was the founder of Viva Systems, um, had this really great insight. And he, um, so he founded Viva Systems. Uh, it's famous because they only raised seven million dollars and had a few million dollars in the bank when they IPO'd a few years ago, and now they're worth almost, I think, eight 10, or ten, 10 billion. billion. Yeah. Um, and, and so, so you can imagine how much the company he owned at the end, and and how well he's done for himself. Well, one of the things he says when he talks about Viva Systems is every company has to have an insight that has only a 25% chance of being right. Like if most people looked at it, they'd be like, that's just stupid. And so with Viva Systems, just to bring it a little bit more tangible, his insight was twofold. One was most people think vertical SaaS is way too small. So I'm going to go after highly verticalized SaaS. It's just going to be for pharma companies. And then the second insight was, I'm going to build everything entirely on top of force.com. And so I'm going to be entirely dependent on Salesforce to build the underlying database for what I'm doing. Most people would say Salesforce will crush you and kill you within a matter of a couple of years. Interestingly enough, Viva Systems, after they've IPO'd, I think last year just re-upped with Salesforce. They are continuing to build on top of force.com. Um, and they, each customer is paying them on average two to $3 million. So it's a very large company. 
But his point was, most people thought verticalized SaaS, stupid idea. Why in the world would you ever build on top of force.com? You will get killed. And so his non-consensus insights were entirely right. And the second piece he says is if you're right, it has to give you massive acceleration into the market. So because he built on top of force.com, he didn't have to hire a ton of engineers to build that underlying data structure. And because he was entirely focused on a particular vertical, he could create value such that he could price even higher than Oracle. And he knew that the value that he was delivering was good. And so not only could he price higher, he knew he would win every deal. And so that, that confidence, that non-consensus but right insight to me is, it's everything, right? From an investor standpoint, it's everything, but from a founder standpoint, it's also everything. And if, if you're pitching VCs, um, if you can help them understand this about your startup, uh, that very often makes them go a quiver, right? So, you know, and very often it flows from some type of domain specific knowledge you have, right? It's like the world believes it's going to be polar coordinates. I think it's going to be Cartesian coordinates. I'm the world's foremost expert Cartesian coordinates. Here's why it's going to be Cartesian. And then as a VC, you're like, wow, you know, that person changed my point of view about that. I think they may be right. And so that's, that's kind of like after they know what you do, that, that is kind of like the aha moment where they're like, ah, I see. They, they have a different view of what's going to happen, and it's grounded in their domain knowledge. It's not, it's not grounded in them just making stuff up and throwing darts against the wall. And then two other characteristics of this proprietary insight is the durability of that power. So a lot of times people will talk about, I have this proprietary knowledge or this proprietary power, and they aren't thinking about how long it lasts. The other thing you have to understand is how long will it be before you realize that power, right? And, and so you really want to have something that's quick to realize and long to hold. There's sort of like an area under the curve that you're really trying to optimize for. And things like first mover advantage that a lot of people like to talk about, it's not very durable at the end of the day, even though it's easy to get. Um, and so, so the types of things that we really love to see are high durable uh, powers like network effects, even though they may take a long time to realize. And so, uh, those are the types of things that we do like to bet upon. Um, second is product market fit, um, product power. So in the, original, um, in the original blog post by Mark Andreessen on product market fit, one of the things that's interesting is that he points out that of the three things that you really think of when you think of this concept of product market fit, you think of product, market, and team. And he comes to the conclusion that the thing that really matters most here, although we call it product power, is actually market. So, you know, you could have a really crappy team, but a fantastic market, the, the market will actually win. You can have a great team, bad market, the market will tend to win. Um, same thing when you, you compare product to markets. You have, countless examples of really bad products in the face of a powerful market pull actually doing a really great job. And so, you know, one of the things that we look for in that and trying to identify what is product market fit really look like, we think of this, this WTF moment, um, which, which I, I saw for sure when Lyft first launched, uh, we had this associate in our firm Tommy Leap, and he comes running into our office within the week that we launched. He said, you do not, you can't understand what you have on your hands. Like I've taken a lift six times. He's this like, week. we're going to make a fortune on this lift deal. <laughs> yeah. And like Mike and I hadn't even taken a lift at that point. We're like, what are you talking about? Um, or, or the Tesla autopilot. If you've ever engaged the autopilot, you just, you press this lever, you pull this lever twice, and it goes bloop, and, um, and all of a sudden, like the steering wheel is moving, and the pedal is pressing itself. Like every time I've done that demo for 
my relatives, they're like, their mind is blown. And, um, and so that moment that is really tangible, particularly in consumer experience, you, can, you know when that happens, um, you'll see it actually in enterprise software too. You see this moment where our data scientist's mind is blown because of a particular product. Um, or a developer is really appreciative of the fact that all their data is one place. You see those moments where they have this WTF experience, and that's that's a more tangible way of thinking about product market fit. Yeah, and the, the other just observation that we've seen is that the most successful products we've seen in the early days usually are pretty uneven. And so I've seen teams that get an A minus in a lot of features, but what what we've seen work better is an A plus in the one or two things that truly matter. Uh, and uh, you know, I like the metaphor I like to use is like Luke Skywalker and the Death Star, right? You've got like a photon torpedo, and you want to blow up the entire Death Star, right? There's like one or two features like that. And um, the 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 test of whether it's a WTF experience is when the customer experiences that rendering of your feature, they never want to go back. Right, it's not just that your product is good, your product literally changed their point of view about what it is, right? So like when we, we used to talk about Lyft, it, it, we were like, it's not enough that you can just get a ride. It's gotta be that um, the first time you take that ride, you're like, I'm done with taxis, that's it. And so like you want it so that there's a couple of things where it's like in this, you know, the other metaphor I like is when you ring the bell in the circus, right? You hit this thing and the thing goes up and if it goes 99% of the way up, it doesn't make a sound. It's got to go all the way up and ring the bell. And so there's like, um, I find it to be extremely focusing for a product team to always be asking in this value hacking phase, like what are the small number of things where we just have to ring the bell, where we just have to have customers say, holy shit, that's amazing. I'm done with the old way. I'm doing it this new way from now on. Because that's what's going to cause them to like, drive you through purchasing if you're a b2b company that's what's going to cause consumers to tell all their friends look at this uh if you're a b2c company and it has to be it has to reach that level where you just emote them to want to be able to tell anybody who will listen this is the way do it this way i have a secret let me tell you my secret and then the last one we'll cover is category power and Category is interesting to us. We, we think of this as, you know, when, when we first describe it to a lot of entrepreneurs, they might just say like, what's the words that describe what I'm doing? And that, that'll be the category. Three letter acronym. Yeah, it's a three letter acronym. Uh, and and, and it, it's so much more than that. It is actually capturing the mindset of the customer. And one of the things that when you look at category and how from a psychologist standpoint, they'll when they study the brain, there's only so many categories you can actually hold in your brain of things. And, and this partially why, like when you go to a grocery store, it's not just a lot of stuff thrown up onto shelves. They're organized by specific categories, right? And so when you say, I'm looking for cereal, they'll say it's in aisle four. Um, because you, you have to be able to put your mental model into, okay, I'm going to buy breakfast items, I'm going to go to aisle four. That's how in all of your buying behaviors, you're probably acting. And so as a seller of any type of product, you have to occupy a certain category within your buyer's mind. And, and you know, startup's a provocative act, right? So like, the, the customer doesn't have a category for you when you start, right? You don't belong in the supermarket. You're literally jumping in front of them as they walk into the supermarket and saying, go to this brand new aisle and buy this brand new thing. And the person's like, what are you talking about? Like, I have my shopping list here. I've never heard of what you do. I don't care what you do. And so, like, what I, you know, to me, category power is also, it's not what you do to the product, it's what you do to the mind of the person that is going to perceive your product how are they going to, how, where do you fit on the shelf space of, your, of their mind? And what have you done to earn the right to tell them the way your mind used to work, you, it's got to work a little bit differently now because people don't like it when you mess with their heads, right? You don't get many chances. And so you don't get many opportunities to explain why they should 
give you a chance to kind of change their mind about, about how to think about you and other, other things. And so, you know, a couple of examples that we would think of when we think of category, examples would be like Starbucks where you went from 50 cent coffee to now you're totally fine spending $5 for a cup of coffee, the iPhone, um, even AWS. Uh, there are a lot of different types of web services that came before AWS, but AWS really caught on. Salesforce killed software. Um, and the, the concept of Tesla as more of a software built car rather than an automotive vehicle. Um, all of these things actually are real, really about how do you shape category. The best categories, interestingly enough, in an HBS study shows they will capture 70% of that market, which means that everyone else is fighting over 30% of the market. And so it really is valuable not only to be the category king, but you actually maximize your chances of being the category king if you're actually the one that defines the category. Because then you get to define the rules, the definition, how, how the game is played within that sector. Not always. Yeah. There's also HBS studies about how it's like third mover is probably what you want to be. But I don't know how that plays with the category king idea. Yeah. Um, so my dad used to run uh, products at Microsoft. And um, he used to tell me, uh, I don't like the term time to market. I like the term time to market volume. And, and so it was like his view of most markets is it's not the first mover. It's the first to scale that wins. And if you're the first mover and you take advantage of your early success, you, you have an incumbent advantage to be the first scaler, but it doesn't necessarily mean you will, right? Like somebody might have, have see your idea quickly and out execute you or out muscle you in the market. The other, the other thing I think we haven't quite covered about category uh, is most, most companies think that their job is to create a product to sell to people. And what we, what we believe is that the best companies that we've been involved with create movements. And so like Ann used the example of the supermarket, Clarence Birdseye, right, the early 1900s, he sees an Eskimo flash freezing a fish on the ice. And they put it by his igloo. And he's like, what's up with that? Why are you flash freezing all these fish? And they're like, well, we can catch a whole bunch of fish at one go and just put them next to our igloo and they'll, they'll keep for a few days. And he's like, oh, I wonder if you could do that with vegetables and fruits and other things. Because if you could do that, you could sell these things in a supermarket even when they're out of season. Or you could sell it at places in the country that can't even grow those things. That would be amazing. So he perfects this model of flash freezing for these fruits and vegetables. Well, okay, great. You're not done if you're Clarence Bird's Eye, right? You've got to convince train cars to put refrigerators in the cars so that you could carry this, this frozen fruit and vegetables. You got to convince supermarkets to create an entire new aisle that's frozen food, right? So like um, Clarence Birdseye wasn't just a product innovator, he was a category designer. And most of these category designers that win think in terms of, I'm not just creating a product to sell people, I'm creating a movement. I'm creating something that um, the point of view is the company and I convince the world that my point of view is right, and so those people become my foot soldiers in uh, bringing the movement forward to the world. And so part of, part of how you get first to market volume, in my opinion, is you, you conceive of the initial product market fit success as the sort of the precursor to this movement. And then, you know, the competitors aren't competing just against you, they're competing against all the people who believe what you believe. And now, now you've got a shot of, of outrunning them. I think there's also this element of like market education and how much do you actually, the first mover actually has to spend a lot on market education. Right. Yeah. And then someone else could actually benefit from that. So I think the classic example of that is SoulCycle versus Peloton, right? SoulCycle created a movement around cycling in groups and like in classes set to music. And then Peloton comes along and says, well, you could do that in your home. 
And all of a sudden, every single person who buys a Peloton no longer takes a SoulCycle class, right? Which is why SoulCycle's having trouble going out and going public. And so, so it's not just that first mover, it's, it's sort of then how do you capitalize on it and then how do you maintain it? Now, I don't know if Peloton can actually maintain that movement, but they've definitely capitalized on it, right? And so, so I don't think that category definition is necessarily means that you're the category king. You can actually co-opt it in a lot of ways. Yeah, and, I, and I think Anne's gonna talk about blitz scaling here in a minute, but like there are times where the market gets energized really quickly and it will be satisfied. And so like this happened to us with Okta, uh, Microsoft decided they wanted to get into cloud-based identity management. And it became clear to Okta that within 18 months, the category king would emerge. And that Microsoft had distribution all throughout the world and that we simply could not tolerate an outcome where they came in, copied all of our ideas at scale and just talked louder than us. And so in that case, we, we concluded it was okay to even spend inefficiently to be the category king because there was like nothing else mattered. That, like the prime directive must be category king, nothing else matters. Uh, and, and so sometimes you find yourself in that situation and it's like not, not moving aggressively into it ends up being the irrational strategy. Yeah, so a couple of quick final thoughts then. Um, so you have different way, different stages of growth. So hacking valued, hacking growth. And then sort of this last category, Reed Hoffman likes to call blitz scaling, uh, which is really capturing that new, new ground, that new category. But what we've seen is actually you're, although you're thinking about the full stack, there's different areas of focus as you build out your company. And the focus tends to be lower on the stack early on and then starts to really move up. And then the other piece to really remember is that every company actually ends up being uh, a combination of these different value profiles. So just because one part of your company is blitz scaling doesn't mean that another product is actually going through hacking value, potentially hacking growth and then ultimately blitz scaling. So you, as a, as a larger company, you have a portfolio of these different value profiles, and you should really be thinking about how you allocate your resources according to which products are in which value profile. Yeah, when you, when you become a, a real company, the job of the CEO increasingly becomes the asset allocator in chief. And you know, you've got a set of products that are brand new, if you try to hack growth too fast in those, like I've seen this happen in boards as well, we'll be doing our second product and some board member will say, well, when is the second product gonna be 30% of our business? Can we do that in the next 18 months? Wrong question, right? The, the right question is, do you have a zero to one value hacking team on that product? And how are we going to think of this as a startup within the company rather than uh, just, you know, start to scale before we have new customers and a new product. And so like a, a company on some level is a bundle of all these different value profiles operating simultaneously. And as a CEO, part of the job is to know what types of people and resources and money and value creation dynamics do I want to apply to each of those things. And then just your two last thoughts. Yeah, so, so the, most, the most common value creation profile I've seen in the Valley, unfortunately, is the denial profile. And the denial profile happens when the amount of value you're creating is not adequate relative to the capital that you're consuming. And um, the, reason, the reason I uh, bring this up is that I've concluded that for the most part, you have to take control of your own value creation agenda as a founder. Uh, I would have thought that VCs are more typically focused on, okay, a dollar comes in the front, how much comes out of the back of, of the kind of metrics we care about. 
I have found that not to be true most of the time, right? I've found that people show up at board meetings, they read the, the deck the night before maybe, and then they look at whether you made the numbers or missed the numbers. If you make the numbers, they say thumbs up, and if you miss the numbers, they say, let me debug why you missed the number. And um, once you've missed the number, it's kind of too late because missing the number is a lagging indicator. The leading activities are about what is your value creation agenda? Are you doing the things that will guarantee via the leading activities that that value will happen on the other side? And I think that it's important with investors, even if they don't know that they should know this, at the very beginning, before there's any board meetings, when money first comes in the bank, the first day or the first week, to sit down with the investors and say, hey, what would be the most valuable use of this money? And, and value is defined as the optimal value creation strategy for this business. You know, how, how will we spend this money and time to maximize the chance that we're the category king, rather than let, made up numbers in a spreadsheet that I have to make from month to month? Uh, because time and again, that's what we've seen happen is, there's made up numbers in a spreadsheet that somebody heard are important. And then pretty soon you get this dynamic with your investors where they're a distant critic about you missing your numbers, right? Rather than kind of having an ongoing discussion about how does value get created in the first place. Yeah, we, we like to say that real growth is a, uh, a combination of ambition and acceptance. And so, um, you know, IBM, ironically, I can tell, I don't, I don't think that they're doing a good job of their products, but I know they're not in a state of denial because they've borrowed over $100 billion to buy back their own stock. And when you do that, you've abandoned all pretenses of being an innovative company, but that's kind of what they are, right? So at least, it, you know, if, if you're IBM, at least you have the intellectual honesty to say, there's no point in me using a profit dollar to build products because I can't innovate. I might as well return to the shareholders, even better, I might as well borrow more dollars and just, you know, interest rates are low, Fed's jack with money supply, might as well buy cheap money and, and uh, buy back shares and have the share price go up. And so, uh, in fact, uh, Fortune 500 will spend $800 billion this year to buy back their own stock. And on, on some level, that's really sad, but on the other level, it's a, a form of acceptance by them that they can't innovate their way out of a out of a paper bag. I think one yep. of the things I would say is that, you know, every every startup actually has its fundamental nature. And in the early stages, the, your job is actually to discover the nature of the business. And then fundraising is actually set around the nature of the business. And too often, founders want to believe that you, that they are their business is venture scale. It's going to be one of the black swans out there. And so you spend money as if that's true from day one. And in reality, there's a lot of different ways in which you can finance the business. And not all of it should be done through venture capital dollars. And, and sometimes along the way, you discover actually a venture scalable business. But if you didn't live to fight another day, you wouldn't actually have that chance to do it. And so the, the concept of ambition and acceptance is to really know the nature of the business that you're building and make sure that the fundraising mechanisms that you have in place actually match what you're building and to be realistic about it, but also to be as ambitious as you could possibly be when you discover that the nature of the business is actually truly scalable. Yeah, it's interesting. One of my recent heroes, in fact, he's just right up the block here, uh, Zuhair over at KeepSafe. We were trying to raise a Series A. We couldn't. And um, we had about three, four months left of cash. We we're probably doing about 200,000 a month of revenue. And um, he says, you know, I think the market's telling us that we're not a growth first company, or at least not good enough as a growth first company. Maybe we need to be profit first. And so I was like, okay, how about this? I'll give you a cushion. If you want to be profit first, you can you can draw another half a million bucks from us at this price and you can draw zero or half a million or any incremental amount you want whenever you want. But I don't want you to be worried about that as you shift to profit first. So he went from 200,000 a month to now uh, close to a million dollars a month and he's got 20% uh, EBITDA margins. 
Well, now he can do a lot of stuff, right? He's got like $5 million cash. He's got, you know, he can use that cash to buy back his own stock. So he owns more of the company. He can use that cash to buy other companies. He can use that cash to create a whole new zero to one value hacking product number two initiative. But what I, what I admired about what he did was that, that acceptance of, I can't, I can't allow myself or tolerate being in the denial profile. If I'm gonna be growth first, I gotta be growth first that's good enough for the money I'm consuming. And if I can't do that, there's no other option but to be profit first. And so uh, he made that hard shift with a lot of courage. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of founders that I know struggle with that. But like, if you're, if, you're in a, if you're in the denial value profile, your money is destroying value every day. And you are on a path to not clearing the preference stack. And that freaking sucks. And that like, it kills me to see somebody devote the best years of their career to a company that's doomed because the value gets less every day. And they just don't know it. And, and it's like people will lie to you about this, right? Like the ecosystem will lie to you and say, oh, don't worry about it. There's going to be more money. You're going to be fine. Just keep trying. But, but, but in the end, like having a reality-based understanding of how you're creating value, what profile you're in, what you should be in, it's, I mean, it's the difference between making it versus, you know, being zero. But I think at the, the, the last point I'd leave we, with is most of why we talk about this is because we love to see the founders work, their life's work, turn into something that is massively scalable. And we've actually seen the stories where the founders stayed lean and figured out a path and ultimately found that scalable path. And to us, that, that's the real reward. And so my, my, my last thought to you would be, don't let other people tell you to start growing if you believe that you shouldn't be growing. Don't let your venture investors, your advisors, or anyone else tell you that it is time to grow. You yourself actually know the best what is the right rate of growth and build it so that it feels right for you and keep some of these principles in mind because at the end of the day you don't want to go back and say oh, i shouldn't have spent that money that way it's the worst kind of regret because it is your life's work and and you don't want to spend your time building for another person rather you are building for yourself cool. any, any other questions or um I've, I've always liked the way Eric Reese always talks about it is that it, it's not, you don't ever run out of money, you run out of experiments, right? And, and inevitably those are actually tied together, right? And so um, the way I've thought about it is, um, and you know, a lot of times we're having this discussion as a partnership, like are they making progress? And sometimes it's just hard to know, right? Like you see the, the difference between founders who are flailing and founders who are moving in a particular direction can actually look somewhat similar at times, right? Um, what I found though is it comes back to that notion of what are the things that you believe that you won't let go of? And what are the things that you can let go of? How would you experiment around that? The places where I actually lose confidence is when there's no core around the things that the founder believes anymore. Like all of those things that we wrote down on that first day 
that get thrown out at some point and like you're testing it all. Yeah, it's like this is hard, let's do an ICO or crypto company, <laughs> right? That kind of stuff. But right. Like that happens, that happens for real. So it's that core uh, belief, I think that that's what ties it together for me as an investor of like, okay, do I still believe in what they're doing and the next iteration? Because if I still believe in that core belief and the experiments are consistent around that, then we're still headed in the right direction. But it is, I mean, that early value hacking phase, the other metaphor I like is you're in a, you're in a dark set of alleyways and you don't know how many alleys there are and you don't know where the money is or if there's money or how much money there is. And you're just kind of systematically wandering, trying to find where the money is without finding a local maximum. And it's just freaking hard, right? There's just no, there's no way around it. That's why founders who navigate that phase well very often get super rich, right? There's very few people in society who can navigate that phase well. And then it's hard again because it's like, it's like a forward pivot, right? Going from value hacking to growth hacking is it's a forward pivot of your entire company. It's all the stuff that got you there that you've built confidence in isn't gonna work anymore. And like you have to master a whole new set of things it's just really scary, right? It's scary and hard, and it just takes incredible finesse and courage and discipline and integrity to go from one mode to the next and, and to like do what's necessary to, to shift those modes. Um, I had a question. So on your slides about the durable, durability, you said like domain expertise in the field was pretty high, uh, it made it more defensible, but then it didn't, cost, didn't take any time to start up. So do you see companies like for example atrian started by someone who's not a lawyer do you see companies where people like engineers will take on like a different field and build something that's defensible or do you feel like you have to have significant years of experience in that domain to start a company there mm -hmm. uh, uh it'll be interesting to see if we're similar or different on this <laughs> answer uh in general um i am a big fan of people with high domain knowledge uh, particularly in a new area, right? Like if it's in a really old area, sometimes you have not so much domain knowledge, but conventional wisdom and, and not the ability to shift. But if you're new, if you're in a new exciting market category technology with unconventional wisdom and a deep proprietary sort of domain knowledge, I, I'm a sucker for those kinds of things. Now, the only, the only caveat I would offer is that I've seen some companies that I thought had no chance, like say Dollar Shave Club. And I, I, I thought it was a phony, bogus company, right? Um, yeah, and, and um, now, now I've, come to re I've come to consider the possibility that those companies can work. Like Casper Mattress, I would have never invested in Casper Mattress, right? Um, because I'm like, the only reason they exist as a company is because the mattress guys can't innovate. Well, what if that turns out to just be true, right? Like, what if it turns out Unilever and Gillette just aren't gonna innovate? What if it turns out that a lot of these Fortune 500 companies will not mount a competitive response? And so I do believe that sometimes not having domain knowledge in the domain can work if that domain is moribund and the real knowledge that matters is turning into software-defined sort of nouveau category, if you will. But, but even then, I'm skeptical, right? Even then, I get skeptical probably more than I should. I think it's like, yeah, the, we don't know if it'll stand the test of time. A lot of times, I, I've had this belief of you don't need that industry expertise, and we're reinventing this industry anyway. And then, you know, 10 years in, you realize, oh, we didn't really reinvent. The industry actually knew what they were doing when they, they decided that this was the right process for buying inventory, right? Like things like that, you should actually really study the current state of the industry and have very good reasons for why you're changing the way things are done. Most of the time when, when I find that we have the hubris to say we're reinventing that industry and we haven't been intellectually curious about how it's been done for real, um, there are more problems that you'll uncover along the way. And so I actually, even if the founder doesn't have that expertise, that founder usually, the ones that are successful will bring in that expertise pretty quickly 
so that they know what they need to reinvent and they know what to beg, borrow, and steal. Yeah, yeah when I was a kid, uh, my dad was a sa in sales at IBM, and he told me this story one time where um, there was this famous CEO of USAA, and he was very well known and charismatic, and he was calling on this guy, trying to sell him mainframes. And he was telling him about how USAA is about to get into banking. And my dad's like, huh, that's funny. I, you know, banking feels pretty different from insurance. You know, like, are you sure that, that that's a business you ought to be in? And he goes, if CEO says, um, insurance is the most complex rate calculation business there is. We stress IT systems like nobody else. Banking is just debits and credits. <laughs> and uh, and it, it ended up being the most failed initiative ever by USAA, right? And it's like, you know, whenever, whenever I hear somebody say, oh, I'm just going to go right in there and outsmart everybody without knowing what they're talking about, I always remember that story. I always think, okay, that founder's saying that's just debits and credits. And usually it isn't just debits and credits, right? Usually it's a lot more than that. Should have done value creation first. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And so, like, it's, I, I get really nervous when you, you ask, like, the idea maze about the domain and the person doesn't know what they're talking about. I'm like, oh boy, here we go. Great. Well, thank cool. you so Thanks much. Thanks for taking the time.